remote island in the Pacific Ocean, a frightening and mysterious massacre took place. A race of stone giants carved a thousand years ago guard the shore in silence, as if unable to endure what they have witnessed. The clues to the mystery remain locked behind mute lips. There is no voice to tell who carved the giants and why hundreds of them were destroyed in the Easter Island Massacre. Easter Island giants defy mankind to reveal their story. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanation, but not necessarily the only ones to the mysteries we will examine. In the beginning of time, legends tell us, land and sea were at war with each other. The crust of the earth exploded in fury and sent molten lava boiling into the sea. The lava cooled and hardened into black rock. Eons ago, an island was born, forged in agony and cursed with a destiny that hangs over it to this day. It is Easter Island, a jagged speck of land on the endless seas halfway between the coast of South America and Tahiti. Easter Island is perhaps the loneliest inhabited place on Earth. Its existence was unknown until it was discovered by a Dutch explorer in 1722. The Dutch ship landed on a warm and balmy Easter Sunday. It was welcomed by a band of natives who swam out to the boat carrying gifts. At one time, the population exceeded 10,000. But since that fateful Easter Sunday, slave raids, civil war, and a smallpox epidemic nearly decimated an entire race. Today, less than 1,000 people live in the only village, Hangaroa, the island is owned by Chile, and the official language is Spanish. But the faces of the people hold no clue to the origin of the first islanders. Over the years, the mix of Polynesian, South American, and European blood has blurred lines of ethnic purity. It was on Easter Island that mankind had one of its most curious ideas. No one knows who had it or why. But the inhabitants of that lonely island undertook what is perhaps one of the most amazing engineering projects of ancient time. They did not build pyramids or tombs. Instead, they carved colossal stone idols in the likeness of man. The stone figures of Easter Island are so massive, their size is difficult to grasp. Standing beside them, a person becomes as small as a fly speck. Statues range between 30 to 80 tons of solid volcanic rock. A small one is equal to the weight of a thousand men and stands as tall as a two-story house. They cover the entire island. Each has a unique character, some morose and brooding, others almost comical. The mysteries that surround the giants begin with the question of why the islanders created so many of these enormous idols. It is as if their fear of life was so terrifying 
they needed a multitude of gods to protect them. Even more mystifying is evidence that many statues appear to have been systematically massacred. Some savagely decapitated and mutilated. A ritual murder seems to have taken place. No one knows who did it or why. The search for answers begins in the quarry, the crater of an extinct volcano, Rano Raraku, a dark and forbidding womb. There are enough questions here to intrigue an army of scientists and fill a bank of computers, but only a handful of men have pursued the quest. Foremost in the search is Dr. Edmundo Edwards, a Chilean archaeologist who has spent the last 10 years probing the riddle of the statues. 500 years ago, the quarry rang with the blows of hammers and the rhythmic chanting of workers chipping stone. Quite suddenly, work was abandoned. Half-finished forms are embedded in the side of the volcano, ranging from embryos to fully formed young gods. Some are difficult to discern because their contours have merged with the crater. Work was stopped so suddenly that the presence of the workers can still be felt. Tools lie in their place, undisturbed for centuries. Crude basalt chisels that were used to carve the expressive faces of the stone gods. Where once the sound of a thousand hammers filled the air, now there is not even an echo. Once finished, all that remained was to sever the umbilical cord. An elaborate pulley system lowered the statues from the mouth of the volcano down the slope. Here, the monoliths were free to begin their lumbering march to the sea. Ancient legend has it that the stone gods were endowed with a supernatural power called mana, a power that enabled them to walk from the volcanic quarry to the sea. There they stopped, each in its place, and turned their backs to the sea so they could cast their mana over the land. The mana emanated through the eyes. The last ritual act of the carvers was to open the stone lids so the mana could escape. At one time, open air temples lined the coast. Then, all the statues with open eyes were smashed and desecrated. The work of restoring the monoliths has only recently begun. Mario Aravallo is a topographer and one of the prime movers in the restoration project. According to the most recent count, there are over 500 battered giants on the island, and many are in the final stages of degeneration. Mario and archaeologist Edmundo Edwards wage a desperate battle to stave off the effects of erosion. The work involves the painstaking process of plotting the position and alignment of each statue. So far, only 12 have been restored because there isn't enough manpower or machinery to save more. Somehow, the statues were transported across 20 miles of rough terrain to the sea. No evidence remains of how the engineering feat was accomplished. But a primitive boat rolling method, still used by local fishermen, provides a glimmering of how it was done. The theory holds that the statues were rolled over miles of wooden skids to the beach. If true, this is one of the earliest uses of rollers known to man. Not even the more technologically advanced Egyptians knew of this method when they moved the giant blocks for their pyramids. 
How did a people, isolated by thousands of miles of endless sea, develop an advanced engineering skill? The riddle of how the statues were moved has challenged many men to come up with a concrete solution. Diagrams illustrate what the ancient method might have been. For Roberto Forster, a local engineer, the theory of the giant rollers is not enough. He swears he can demonstrate a more practical method. He calls his invention the fulcrumista. As in the seesaw, the principle of the fulcrum is to exert the greatest possible leverage in the lifting of an object. In an experiment executed on a small scale, Roberto intends to move a five-ton stone to prove how a 50-ton giant might once have been transported. Roberto prevails on the mayor to gather a workforce for his project. He vows he will solve the ancient riddle once and for all. The mayor has doubts, but agrees. The experiment is scheduled for tomorrow morning. The experiment will be carried out on a small scale. A five-ton stone replacing the 50-odd tons of a monolith. <laughs> on the appointed morning, a workforce gathers for the momentous test. Roberto's fulcrumista will either stand or fall. Edmundo, Mario, and even the mayor himself have joined in the effort to put to rest once and for all the question of how the statues were moved. A fiasco. Indeed, if the attempts of modern man to solve these incredible engineering feats meet with failure, think of the ingenuity of the ancient carvers. One may well wonder if the peoples of those early times did not have gifts that have been lost to us. The secret remains locked behind stone faces. Faces that remind archaeologists of another face staring out over its mountain kingdom. The place is Tiahuanaco, Bolivia, an ancient civilization built on a bleak plateau in the Andes. Stone gods separated by 4,000 miles and a span of at least as many years. There is no evidence that there was any contact between the two cultures. And yet, the features bear an uncanny resemblance. With what common spirit might they have been invested? one of the seven written tablets found on the island contain the answer. The pictographs are like those of no language known on Earth. They have not been decoded, but anthropologists believe they tell a dark and bloody tale. There is evidence that long ago, the island was torn by terrible civil strife. 
with brother pitted against brother. The bones of hundreds of islanders have been found in caves that stretch for miles under the lava crust. What were the natives hiding from? Why were they slain? Edmundo ascribes it to overpopulation and starvation. He speculates that in mass frenzy, the strongest killed the weakest and survived by eating human flesh. The survivors set up the worship of a new god, the Birdman, who dove on his prey from the sky. Folklore has it that on the first day of spring, the strongest men would swim through shark-endangered waters to the tiny island that lies offshore. They would search the crags for the Manutara egg and swim back, carrying the prize in their mouths. The first man back was proclaimed king for one year. Perhaps the petroglyphs tell the story of the days that preceded the Birdman cult. Archaeologists have labored since the glyphs were first discovered in 1922 to decipher the meaning of the bizarre symbols. The chalk paint accentuates the designs, but cannot unlock the meaning of the curious etchings. Only a tragic face remains as an emblem of past events. The strongest clues seem to lie in the myths and legends handed down by word of mouth over the centuries. Juanito Huera is a noted linguist who understands many tongues. The old woman begins to chant a tale about a war between the long ears and the short ears. Her story bears the epic ring of heroic battles and great conquests. It sounds like a tale out of ancient Greece. A great saga in which the short ears rose from enslavement and in a battle that rumbled like the quaking of the earth, slew every man, woman and child who had long ears. Mythology, with its strange symbols, plays tricks on the imagination. But it springs from real events that once occurred. 
And there is little doubt that the events on Easter Island have been bloody and tragic. The tragedy was matched by the fate of the islanders and provides a final clue to the Easter Island mystery. History records that thousands of natives died under the guns of their conquerors and from the dread diseases brought with them. The endless waves, of course, have seen it all. They saw brave people put their hope and faith in mighty gods carved from stone. And they saw the failure of those gods to protect them. It was that failure that may have led to the massacre of the stone giants. On a remote speck of land in the South Seas, a great civilization flourished and died. The wide-scale destruction of the giants of Easter Island is symbolic of the tragic destiny of a people. It is also testament to the power of faith. A faith that motivated thousands of men to toil relentlessly on stone monoliths. And a faith so strong that when it was lost, it may have driven them to turn against their own gods with a terrible vengeance. Thank you.